All right. Welcome to this year's Cabula Poetica. How many of you saw the first event? Yes. Fantastic. It's just going to keep going and going. Poetry all the time. Um, as, as we've been doing uh, as consistently as we can, we do video record these events and then we put them on the YouTube channel. So just be aware that the camera is recording the event. It's focused up here, though. As you come in, uh, be sure to grab a cookie, a glass of water as you get settled. In addition to today's event, next week we have poet Rob Falconer. He'll be doing a poetry talk at 2.30, just like this, and then he'll also be doing an evening event at 7 p.m. again in this room at 209A. The series always concludes with the MFA poetry reading, and that's on December 13th. It's our MFA poet's final exam. So I hope you all enjoy that. Come back for a celebration of student work. Tabula Poetica this year is sponsored by the English Department, the Dean's Office of Wilkinson College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and also Poets and Writers. Special thanks to Julia Ainley. She's not here today, but she handles the logistics for the whole Tabula Poetica series, and she's done an absolutely amazing job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, also, thanks to Graduate Programs Coordinator David Krausman. He handles all the logistics for Carolyn Forche's Presidential Fellow Visits. I can't... Uh, as some of you know, he does a lot of other things. <laughs> so, whether it's online, in person, whenever you enjoy a literary event, what are you going to do? You're going to buy the books of the author that you so enjoy. So I just want to point over here to the bookstore. Two, two of Carolyn's most recent books are for sale. Um, her latest poetry book and her memoir. What else do we need to take care of before we start? <laughs> This is my favorite part. I practice this all the time. All the time. I dream about this. <laughs> Silence your mobile devices, please. But if you also want to use your mobile device to spread the word on social media that you're enjoying poetry at Chapman University today, I encourage you to do that. I'm not actually going to introduce the poem. I am going to introduce my fabulous colleague, Dr. Jan Osborne. <laughs> so Jan is one of those people whose enthusiasm for collaboration and inclusion and culture makes me really happy to be part of this English department. So Jan, the podium is yours. That was silly. I didn't think you would introduce the introducer. <laughs> but thank you. That was very sweet. So I was in my car. And I was, I don't know where I was going. I forget wherever I was going. I don't know where I was going. And I can't see these women on my glass side. Okay. I was in my car. And I was, I just turned the radio station. And I heard this voice. And it took me, like, maybe... Maybe five or six seconds. I know, I know that voice. I know that voice. And then I listened. You know, Harper's sitting right with me. And I turned to her and I said, I know that voice. And I listened. I did know that voice. It was Carolyn Porsche. And I listened to what she had to say. And I listened to that voice ringing in my ear. And today, you get to hear that voice live. I, 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 I know people make fun of me about my enthusiasm, but what a joy. What a joy. You're going to hear that voice today. 
I am not going to list Carolyn Forche's awards. The acclaim her work so rightfully has garnered. Will you please Google her tonight? Not now, tonight. You will be impressed. <laughs> I want rather, I want to ask you to hear that voice. I want you to read this new book of poetry in the lateness of the world. For Carolyn Forche is voice in our ears, voice on the page. Hers is a voice that bears witness, witness to the war in El Salvador, 1979 to 1992. Just let that sink in. A contradictory war, maybe as all wars are contradictory, a war with campesinos caught in the middle of great powers, including the United States. A war, like maybe all wars, to which we acquiesce, look away, put out of our minds. But Carolyn Forche's poetry, her voice and her vision, her poetry of witness, asks us to see, to hear, not just about this war, but about human suffering, the suffering of all war, of refugees, of the dispossessed, the immigrant, the city under siege by other great powers. She asks us to hold these words, this witness to the light. She asks us to wake up. Please listen to Carolyn Forche. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you for having me and for being here in this, in this wonderful rain. Two days of rain, it's never rained when I've been here before. I'm really <laughs> impressed and happy. Um, I, I want to tell you that that thing about the radio voice, you know, um, my, my late mother-in-law was watching television um, with her husband, and it, the Ken Burns film came on about the Statue of Liberty. I'm interviewed in that film by Ken Burns because I was a young poet and they wanted to ask a poet. They also interviewed James Baldwin, and we were back-to-back -back in the film, so I was very proud of that. But she's watching it, and she turns to Peter, and she says, that girl looks familiar. <laughs> and he said, of course she does. She's your daughter-in-law. <laughs> so I thought, okay. <laughs> the voice gets recognized again. I want to thank Anna Leahy and David Krausman and the English department and the president's office and, and, and the tab tabula and everyone else who made this possible and gets this all arranged to bring me here twice a year. Uh, as a presidential fellow, I really uh, look forward to these visits. I like Chapman University very much. Um, there's something very special here, as you know, and it's why you're here. Um, this class, most of you are in a class um, on the rhetoric of identity. So I'm going to try to touch on that, as well as the memoir and the poetry and do several things at once in this hour and try to leave time for any questions at all that might occur to you. And they can be about poetry or memoir or writing or identity, any other issue. This is a very important day for the Republic too, I forgot to mention yeah. that. I hope you've all already visited the polls or will do so shortly. I started writing poetry when I was nine years old I wrote the way other kids draw compulsively. It's just something I love to do. Um, fortunately, I fell in love with it before it was assigned in school. So I could really like it, and I didn't have to, you know, learn to like it later. I wrote paragraphs and poems and short stories and a really bad novel that starred a kind of female version of myself in the 19th century. It was quite melodramatic. I put it away forever. Um, but... I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know any adult writers. There were no writers in the community where I lived. I'm from Detroit and the surrounding area, and there were no writers. 
So I didn't realize you could be a writer when you grew up. Um, writers, of course, maybe they don't grow up, but they can be writers when they grow up. So I tried to find um, other things to do with my life, but I kept writing and writing and believing that someday maybe I could, maybe I could even publish a book of poems. Um, I did publish a book of poems when I was 26 years old. I was pretty young to do it. I was very lucky because my poem got picked in a contest, my book of poems, and it was published. And after that, I had trouble writing. And so I started translating a Salvadoran woman poet. She was born in Nicaragua, but mostly she grew up in El Salvador. And her daughter was my best friend, which is how I discovered her. Her daughter and I went to Spain to stay for the summer with Clarivel La Alegría because uh, she was going to help us with our project of translating her poems into English for the first time. I'm skating rapidly through a very complicated story. But I spent the summer there and it began to open my eyes to things that I uh, didn't know anything about from my schooling in the United States and my upbringing. It began that summer, I listened to people talking about Central America, which meant talking about poverty and oppression. It meant talking about military dictatorship. It meant talking about violent uprisings and about coups and about hardship. And I left that summer to go back to the United States, feeling something a lot of young Americans feel. Uh, I felt like I wanted to do something about what I had learned about over the summer. I felt almost embarrassed to be from the United States when I learned that most of the suffering that I was hearing about in South America as well as Central America was perpetrated by governments that were supported by my own government. And so I was a I would say I was somewhat depressed when I got I got back to California. I was teaching at San Diego State University. I lived in Encinitas right on the ocean. It was beautiful. It was idyllic. I was depressed. I wanted to do something more with what I had learned. I wanted to do something with my life, but I wasn't sure what. I loved teaching, but I still wanted to do something more. And one day... A car pulled into my driveway, it was a vehicle, like an early SUV. And it had El Salvador license plates and it was covered with dust. And I wasn't expecting anyone and I was home alone. And my, my mother, who had seven children, I'm the eldest, taught us never to open the door to strangers when you're home alone. And I was watching this person get out of this truck in my driveway, but then two little girls jumped out. And I thought, oh, maybe, an axe murderer wouldn't hang out with two little girls or they wouldn't hang out. So maybe everything is okay. And it turned out, he, he rang the doorbell. At first, I wasn't going to open it. And then I opened it with the chain lock on. Mm. I thought, what could, what could go wrong? You know, as a chain is on him. He said, you are Carolyn Forche, and I am Leonel Gomez Vidas, and these are my daughters. And I had heard this name before in Spain. They talked about this Leonel a lot. They said he was, he was a cousin of theirs. He was very mysterious. He was very intelligent. He was a motorcycle racing champion. He was a, a champion marks, marksman. So he, was a, he could shoot very accurately. He could race motorcycles. He was um, a strange guy, they said. They said, maybe he works for the CIA. Maybe he's with the guerrillas. Nobody knows what he really does. But I knew one thing. He was standing on my front porch <laughs> in Southern California. And so I, I, he had driven all that way with his two daughters. So because the girls were there, I, I went and showed him some photographs. I passed them through the door. And I said, if you are Leonel Gomez, 
which might be a problem in itself. But if you are him, who are these people in the photographs? And he identified them. He knew Clavel and everybody. He, so I said, okay, and I took the chain off the door and let him in. And he had me clear off the table and he put white paper all over the table and taped it down. And he put all kinds of stuff in the middle of the table, salt and pepper shakers, pack of cards, anything he could find around the kitchen. He put it in the middle of the table, he got all these pens out and he sat down and he began to talk and he talked for three days. <laughs> and I just mostly listened and tried to follow what he was saying and asked questions. He began with the history of Central America from the conquest to the present with the cultivation of indigo and cacao and so on. He went through the whole thing with the Spanish galleons, and, you know. It was fascinating. And then uh, by the end, he was, he was described, he, he drew pictures of everything as he taught, cartoon drawings and other kinds of drawings. He didn't say anything without drawing it. I learned why later. He had a reason that he did that. But it was a beautiful mural by the time those three days were up. We hadn't slept much, the girls slept. Uh, when I went up to bed, I just, I was lying in the bed at night thinking, what am I, what is he, what, what does he want, you know? He was fascinating. He said, there's going to be a war in El Salvador in three to five years. I need a poet to come now. Now, nobody had ever said that, I don't think, to any other poet that I know, but certainly not to me. We need a poet because there's going to be a war. I couldn't make the connection, you know, like how does it follow? What is a poet for in a war? And he said, because I need someone to absorb the whole situation now and learn as much as you can about the country. And then when the war starts, you can come back and talk about it in the United States. And so I suggested a journalist. Mm -hmm. Maybe he just had the wrong kind of writer. He was not thinking about it the correct way. And he said, no, when the war starts, we're going to be swarming with journalists. We'll have plenty of journalists. They'll all show up when the fighting begins. Yeah. He said, that's not what we need. We need somebody who can, he said, poets are, you know, they're a little weird, he said. And they have strange perceptions, and they have interesting ways of thinking. But most importantly, they can put language together in an interesting way. He said, I assume you could do that. You're a poet. And so he asked me to come, and I had a fellowship grant. I could go. I was free to go. But um, I didn't know him very well. My friends all said, you're going to get malaria or something. You're, this is crazy. Even his, even his relatives say they don't know who he really is. They all disagreed about my going to El Salvador. They all said that during my fellowship, I should go to Paris mm -hmm. and write poetry, or at least New England, they said. <laughs> go somewhere where they write poetry. <laughs> so all of my friends, I didn't tell my parents. I didn't ask my parents whether I should go or not. I didn't even tell them about it. I knew what they would say, uh, but I asked everybody else, and everybody else said, no, 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 no. Finally, one friend said, I think you want to go, and I think you're going to keep asking people until someone agrees with you and thinks you should do it. So he said, let me be that person. I think you should go. Really? I said, so I, I had my ticket. I was all set. The suitcase was packed. He was right. I wanted to go. And the book, the the this book, What You Have Heard is True, is the story of the journey that I took. And it's told so that the reader never knows more than I knew at the time. And the story unfolds. And it's told by my much younger self. It's told by a, a girl in her 20s, young woman. Um, I was different than I am now. I tried to keep what I am now out of the story. Uh, I tried to become the person I was then. You know, of course, that we are many people at once. We're the person we are with our parents. We're a different person with our boyfriend or girlfriend or lover or partner. We're a different person with our peers. We're a different person in a classroom. We're a different person at work with our boss. 
All of those people live in the same body. Have you ever had that experience where uh, different parts of your life come together in the same room and it's, and it's strange for you? Like you can't quite, you don't know which person to be because these other parts of your life are there. Well, during your life, you also leave selves behind and you kind of mold, you know? You lose the older self and you grow into a new self. You grow into new possibilities and abilities. We're talking about the rhetoric of identity now. Identity is fluid and complex and it's always <coughs> developing. It doesn't have to be static. It's not a label. It's not something that where you are stuck in something. It's something that you work out. You're always making meaning out of your life, shaping your life in your mind, narrating yourself to yourself, going forward in your life, figuring out things that you care about and things you no longer care about and things you're interested in. And it's, you know, as you know, I hate this because it's so cliche, but life is a journey. So this was a journey from the ringing of the doorbell to scattering Lionel's ashes on the slopes of a volcano where most of the war was fought that he was trying to prevent. And I wrote it, I wrote it partly just to set the record straight because there have been for years all kinds of fantasies and stories and rumors about what Forche did in El Salvador. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll finally say what happened. The other reason I wrote it was that I had Salvadoran students coming to my classes and for years they would come to the office by themselves and say, can you tell me about El Salvador like in the early 80s uh, because my parents ran away from there, but they won't talk about it. My parents won't ask, answer my questions. My parents don't really want me to know about this for some reason. And so I really want to know. So will you tell me what it was like? So I finally realized after having many of these conversations that there were a whole generation of Salvadoran Americans who were either born here or brought here when they were too young to know what was going on. And, and from other countries as well, people who came here as little kids don't know what they're, why they're here and then have to deal with this place and all of its complexity, which is another layer of forming identity. Who You have a, someone, a, you have the family and the, perhaps the origin country that you feel a great connection to, and then you have this country, which is made of so many different peoples and is founded on documents, papers, not on the fact that we're all related to each other. So even though humans are all related to each other, but um, I'm going off track. I always do that. I go off track. But what I want to say is that it was an important story for me to tell, and I did it for those Salvadoran students and for young people, because this generation, meaning you, have an interesting challenge that no other generation has had quite in the same way. And I think you know it, and I think you know what I'm talking about. You were born in a very imperiled time. And so what you really need is for people to get, somehow older people, to get that life for you is not like it was when they were young. This is a hard thing for older people to understand, yet another identity and narrative. Because, you know, for, for eons of time, children learn from their parents. I feel that now the older generations have to be in a position to learn how to learn from their children because you are coming of age in a moment of great complexity and absolutely every respect I can think of. So I'm going to read you a little moment from this book just to give you a glimpse of it. I was always asking about political prisoners, you know, where are they? I had lists from Amnesty International. Lionel took me everywhere in the country, he introduced me to everybody. And it was always one person, then another person, a very, very, very poor hamlet, little village. And then I would go to this rich person's house, you know, and they would be coffee girl 
hours. But then he would take me to the army barracks and talk to military officers. It was back and forth, back and forth, quick to get a whole, over a course of time, it took about almost two years, a, a mosaic picture of the country in all of its complexity put together. And, you know, he said something interesting. He said, if you can figure this place out, if you can absorb it, if you can understand all of the dimensions of it, he said, it's sort of like this everywhere. If you can understand this place, you'll understand many other places in my, you know, in a, this is a microcosm of many things going on in the world in other places. So um, because I was interested in human rights and I was trying to work in human rights there, he said, tell you what, I'll get you into a prison. You can take a look around. If you see anything, you can report it to Amnesty International. You can memorize the inside of the prison. You can see what is happening there. You can make a mental map of it while you're in there. I'm going to arrange for you to visit a friend of mine, and I'm going to tell the warden that you are also a friend of this man, and you're just visiting. And he said, I knew the warden. We went to second grade together. And he said, so I think he'll let you in. You'll have about a half an hour. He said, are you willing to go in a, in a prison? There are political prisoners there. It's guarded by military people. And I said, sure, I, I would consider that. And he said, fine, because we're here. And he pulled up into this compound. <laughs> I said, you mean right now? He said, well, can you think of a different time? He said, no, no, it's now. I already arranged it. We're all set. And, and then he, he started telling me what I, should, what I should do when I was inside this prison. And I said, well, aren't, um, aren't you coming too? And he said, no, 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 it's better if you go alone. He said to me, I thought, okay. He said, it just really is better. So don't worry, you have about a half an hour. And he said, just pay attention and you know, you'll be okay. And he said, by the way, the friend's name is Miguel. Pretend you know, you know him already, just pretend. He's a nice guy. He has phlebitis, so he's he's got a crutch he uses because phlebitis is something wrong with the blood vessels in the leg or something like that. At the entrance, there was a guard booth and a soda machine stocked with Fanta and knee-high, the grape and orange drinks of my childhood. There were several soldiers there, guards, I suppose, but they looked like regular army to me, and they carried G3 automatic weapons. Standard issue for the army. Lienel shook hands with the man I presumed was the warden. And they talked for a few minutes by themselves with their faces turned away from everyone else. When Lienel turned back again, a man was coming toward us, leaning on a crutch as he walked, his pants torn up the side to make room for a bruised and swollen leg. He dragged himself toward me by the crutch and smiled and held out his hand. It's so good to see you again, Catalina. How have you been? Well, very well. I'm fine, I said, or something like that. And then remember to say, your family sends love. They miss you. He was tender-eyed and unshaven with crow's feet that belied his youth. Gracias, Catalina. Tell them the leg is a bit better. Would you like something? He was dragging himself toward the soda machine. Lionel was still talking to the warden. The soldiers were near. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. Miguel already had a coin from his pocket and met my eyes and whispered, take it, as he handed me an opened bottle. You'll need it. I took a sip and Miguel smiled. He was younger than I thought he would be, perhaps 30 or so, not much older than me. And he was thin from a hunger strike but his eyes were bright and gentle. What happened to your leg? Didn't me madre tell you? I have thrombosis, but it's getting better. Shall we go? He nodded toward the prison entrance where the gate was opening for us. And after passing through another set of gates, we were inside. The stench came first. Rotting coffee husks mixed with human waste. The hot smell of blood and sharpness of urine lifting from the pails that lined the hallway. 
an odor of unbathed humans together with smoke from the many tin can fires, cans punched with holes holding burning coals and over them men were heating rations of beans and tortillas. The prison had four wings and an open courtyard. The hallways on the four wings gave on to this courtyard, so the odors and cook smoke lifted toward the clouds, but the stench still hung trapped in the air. I put the Fanta to my nose, and Miguel smiled. The men filled the courtyard, lining all four wings, squatting on the tiles or sitting with their backs to the wall and their legs outstretched. When I walked through the hall, some of the men pulled their legs in to make way for me, and some didn't. Some had tucked newspapers into the rims of their straw hats, and these hung down over their faces and all around their heads. They tented their heads with newspapers for privacy. They were wearing their own clothes, not prison uniforms, but rags, filthy, torn garments, pocked with holes. As Miguel walked on his crutch, the prisoners pulled their legs away to let him pass. I walked close to him. There's where we sleep, he whispered, pointing to a room that appeared to be lined with wooden shelves. Those are the barracks. This place was built to hold about 200 men, but there are twice that number here now. He stabbed the tile with his crutch and kept moving. Here are the latrines. Don't go in there. The odd thing was that no one was looking at me. As I approached, they turned their faces away or looked down at the floor or at one another. Only Miguel looked, and it was quiet, too. When we were outside in the beginning, I could hear a din of voices and shouts and even laughter coming from inside, but now nothing. Here are the workrooms. These were long, narrow rooms with wooden benches, the walls made of peeling concrete painted aqua. I didn't see any tools or other evidence of work. We turned a corner where a group of prison guards had gathered in a circle, playing a game with dice, thoroughly occupied with the game, tossing dice and laughing or groaning. No one looked at us. We made almost a full circle of the courtyard on all four wings. Miguel glanced around cautiously. Listo, he whispered. Are you ready? He locked eyes with me then asked if I saw the dark, open doorway nearby. I did. It was not quite ten feet away, a room with an entrance like the barracks, like the workrooms, but it was on the other side of the courtyard, the far side. No one is paying attention to you now. Just walk into that room and try to see what you can. Don't stay long and control your face when you come out. I'll be right here. If anyone sees you and asks what you are doing, just make an absent-minded North American lady face. And he imitated such a face by looking at me blankly with his mouth slightly open. I had never seen anyone do that before and didn't realize that this is what we looked like to others. And just say that you got lost. For a moment, I froze, and then he smiled and nodded yes to me, tossing his head in the direction of the doorway. Go now, quickly. I was inside the room. It was darker than any other room in the prison, and it stank more. I tried to adjust my eyes to the darkness. Try to see, Lionel had said. It was what he was always asking me to do. Try to see. Look at the world, he'd say, and not at the mirror. What I saw were wooden boxes about the size of washing machines, maybe even a little smaller. I counted the boxes. There were six, and they had small openings cut into the fronts with chicken wire mesh over the openings. They were padlocked. As I stood there, some of the boxes started to wobble a little, and I realized that there were men inside them. Fingers came through one of the mesh openings. Blood rushed to my ears, and I stood trying to orient myself so I could know not only where the room was, but also which wall the boxes were against. And then I walked slowly toward the light of the open doorway and into the hall where Miguel was standing against his crutch. As I came toward him, he whispered, tie your sweater sleeves around your neck. You have hives. I get hives, not as often as I once did, but in childhood, frequently, whenever I was afraid or nervous, 
were sad. They bloomed on my neck and face, so I did as he asked and tied the sweater sleeves. That's La Oscura, the darkness, solitary. Sometimes men are held in there for a year and can't move when they come out because of the atrophy of their muscles. Some of them never recover their minds. Tell them on the outside, tell them. And then raising his voice, he said, Catalina, it has been nice to see you again. Give my love to Anna and Carlos. He was walking, whispering again, Hil gracias, it's time for you to go. Go, he said, motioning with his head toward the gate. But will you be all right? Como no, he said, go. At the entrance, Lionel was waiting, as promised. But beyond him, soldiers had surrounded his hiachi and were looking through the windows. He rested his hand on my shoulder, and we began walking side by side. Why are they? I don't know. I guess we're going to find out. Okay, so that is a piece of this book, and there's a lot of things in it. He's very, very funny. So there's a lot of funny bits in the book. Um, I want you to know that because reading a section like that can make you feel like it's just going to be one very difficult thing after another. And it, there's a lot of that. There has to be. But he's a character. And I hope I captured him as a character. Now, it's not, so this book is drawn from my own life, but it's not about me. This is a book about El Salvador. And the main character is not me. It's a Salvadoran, Leonel Gomez. There's a second main character named Margarita Herrera, who was a good friend of mine who didn't like me in the beginning. <laughs> so characterization is all about change and growth, right? So this is a story of, of Salvadorans trying to get American to open her eyes. This is a story about Salvadorans trying to get an American to understand something. So that's what it, that's what it is. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not about me, really. Uh, everything in it is true, but I wrote it like it's a novel. You know, there's dialogue and scenes and it's not written just telling people, telling them, telling, telling. Lionel put me in all kinds of situations. Maddeningly, he would never answer my questions. If I asked him a question, he'd create a situation and put me in the situation so I could figure it out for myself. This was his method. Now, there are stories all around you. And if you're a writer and you, and you talk to people and they find out you're a writer, they will often tell you a lot more than they would tell other people. You know how when you're riding on a bus or, or something, and you talk to the person next to you and suddenly you're telling them things you would never tell anybody else, you know, and they the same with you, and you talk about deep things for the whole bus ride, and then you say goodbye forever. Well, because you're saying goodbye forever, this is one of the reasons you can tell them those things. I'm going to illustrate one poem from this book by telling you about how you discover the stories around you. Um, trees, the tr when you saw a tree and have all the rings tell the story of the tree. When you walk through a city, if you know about buildings and, and what the styles of buildings were at different times, you can read the city like a book. And cities tell their stories. Everything around us is always telling its story to us. And we ourselves are always living our story, living it forward, remembering it backward. I taught for a semester at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a very cold place in the winter. It was a winter semester. Milwaukee is freezing cold, even colder than where I grew up in Michigan. So I lived in a hotel downtown because the campus was right close to the downtown and it was walking distance on a nice day. But a lot of the days weren't so nice, and so I would get I would get a taxi to take me to the campus. And there were about 100, 200 camp taxis roaming around downtown Milwaukee. But this coincidentally, by the way, I don't believe in coincidences. We can just get that straight. But uh, coincidentally, as people like to say, this one driver picked me up a whole lot of times. So much so, we recognized each other. He said, I've driven you before. I said, yeah, I know. 
And he said, and then I looked on the, you know how they have that little card on the visor and it has the picture and everything? I said, I don't usually ask people where they're from. You know, it's kind of rude in the United States to do that now, you know? But I asked him, he said, ah, oh, I'm from Homs in Syria. I said, how was your journey here? And he looked at me like, you want, you want to know? I said, yeah, how, what, how did you get here? What happened? And it was snowing. And he stopped the cab in front of the hotel and turned the engine off. And it was snowing and snowing and snowing. If it snows enough, I mean, maybe you don't know this because you live here, but the snow will cover the car. It coats all the windows. You're, you're in a little white cocoon of a, a snow igloo. And he told me his story on the condition, he said, that someday, if it's possible, I will write about it. And I said, I don't know, Holmes, you know, I can't tell whether I'll write about it because you can't really decide what you're going to write about when you start a poem. You just have to start with some image and see what happens. That's the way poems get written. He said, well, if it happens, do it. So this is his story, and it's, it's in his voice, and it's what he was saying. It's called The Boatman. I had already been on an island in northern Greece for seven summers teaching, and it was the island right next to Lesbos, which was the island where all the refugees are in the camps. During that time when all the refugees were coming from North Africa, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from the countries where Americans had their wars and people had to flee, and Libya, um, a lot of people, the boats weren't good. And a lot of people drowned on the trip in the Mediterranean and the Aegean. So he was in such a boat, the boatman. We were 31 souls, he said, in the gray sick of sea, in a cold rubber boat, rising and falling in our filth. By morning, this didn't matter. No land was in sight. All were soaked to the bone, living and dead. We could still float, we said, from war to war. What lay behind us but Ruins of stone piled on ruins of stone. City called Mother of the Poor, surrounded by fields of cotton and millet. City of jewelers and cloak makers, with the oldest church in Christendom and the sword of Allah. If anyone remains there now, he assures, they would be utterly alone. There is a hotel named for it in Rome, 200 meters from the Piazza di Spagna, where you can have breakfast under the portraits of film stars. There, the staff cannot do enough for you. But I am talking nonsense again, as I have since that night we fetched a child, not ours, from the sea, drifting face down in a life vest its eyes taken by fish or the birds above us. After that, Aleppo went up in smoke and Raqqa came under a rain of leaflets warning everyone to go. Leave, yes, but go where? We lived through the Americans and Russians, through Americans again, many nights of death from the clouds. Morning surprised to be waking from the sleep of death, still unburied and alive, with no safe place. Leave, yes, we'll obey the leaflets, but go where? To the sea? To be eaten? To the shores of Europe? To be caged? To camp misery and camp remain here? I ask you then, where? You tell me you are a poet? If so, our destination is the same. I find myself now the boatman driving a taxi at the end of the world. I will see that you arrive safely, my friend. I will get you there. Okay, so next time you're in a taxi, talk to the driver. 
<laughs> I do it all the time, or I just I just seem to be just a nosy person, but I'm always asking them things, you know? So uh, maybe I'll just read a couple more poems and then we can talk a little. Um, my life is all made up of different journeys and places and things. So uh, right now I'm thinking about I'm thinking about Ukraine because I have a very good friend who's a poet who um, who's from Ukraine. I started teaching him when he was 19 years old. His name is Ilya Kaminsky. I hope you meet him someday. He's got two books, Dancing in Odessa and Deaf Republic. And in 2004, I got a little bit of money for writing this, and I took him back to Odessa so he could see the country that he fled as a kid. I'm kind of obsessed with people who leave their countries and as young people, I think. Maybe there's a theme here. And, and need to find out about it or need to go back or something to connect in themselves who they are. Anyway, we went there in 2004 and this when this war started, it bothered me. I, I couldn't get my mind on anything else. I was awake at night, I had kind of insomnia and I was I was studying the maps and I was thinking, all of those tanks and all of that gunnery, all of that is surrounding Odessa. You don't put all that military equipment on the border of a country if you're not going to use it. But meanwhile, the TV people who are always telling us what's happening and almost never is what's happening, said, oh, well, we don't know yet whether there's going to be an invasion. Well, everybody's moving toward the border. You know, if you know anything about history or militaries, you know that they have something in mind. So when the war started, it was January, uh, February 24th, this part of the war, this full-scale invasion of this past year, I had this, I, I was invited to be on a Zoom with poets from Ukraine. Zoom. Zoom was like we were all in the same apartment building, only we weren't. Their windows in the Zoom were in an apartment building in Lviv, in Kiev, in Kherson. They were some of them already under bombardment. I was in the Zoom in Maryland, a suburb of Washington, D.C. So I was in a different building altogether. But we shared the time, and it was like they said, thank you for being here, and thank you for, if the technology holds up, we'll be able to stay together for a little while. So I decided before the Zoom that I needed to write something for them. And it couldn't be a poem because I didn't have time to write a poem. Poems for me take a long time. And I have to live with them for a long time to make sure they're okay. So this is what I came up with for them. And it's just a message. You know how you wish you had the power to make something not happen, to reverse something that's happened? So just a little message, it's an urgent message, it's not a poem, and then we can talk if we have any time. I'm completely, I'm completely spaced out on what time it is because <laughs> two days ago I was in Istanbul, Turkey, oh. for real. And I was giving a poetry reading, and I flew over the pole and down through Canada, and now I'm here. So I have no idea what time it is, actually. <laughs> this is the message I wrote for them. If there is ink for this hour, if there is something to say, to write, that would send the tanks, the convoys and transports into reverse on the roads they have rutted, send them back to the borders they crossed, send them back and the hours too that have passed since dawn on the 24th day of the second month, send those hours with them and the enemy soldiers dragging with them their crematorium and the corpses of their fellow soldiers they have left behind and their own wounded, send them back if there is ink, if there is something to write that would raise the cities from the ruins, the apartment blocks, hospitals, schools, that would put the cities back as they were, I would give everything to fill my pen with it. Okay, now how much time have I got and what are your questions? <laughs> Oh, because just it's not a poem because I didn't revise it. 
and I didn't sit with it for three years in the drawer. And you know, it's not a poem because it wasn't done the way I usually do things. That's the only reason. But I felt like it had to go out into the world. And it was translated right away into Ukraine, and then it was put on a broadside, and then it was published, and now it's in Ukraine everywhere. It's one of those weird things that happen right in the very beginning. And I'm still, I'm about to, I'm assembling a, a, an anthology right now of poets of Ukraine who are writing during the war, and we're putting it all together for publishing in April. Okay. So when I come back to Chapman, I'll have that book with me. I come back here every year. I really <laughs> love it. Okay. <laughs> so I'll be back in January also. So what would you like to talk about? Or would you like to say anything that isn't a question? Now, they don't usually do that, audiences. They always say, now, we want your questions, but, you know, um, if you'd like to say anything, if you'd like to ask anything, can be about anything at all, small, big, a detail, a large issue, whatever you like. Yes. Um, Project Kinship, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... Obviously, right now, there's also a lot going in Iran. Yes. Uh, my sister is married to a Persian, so I'm very, like, close to that because it's my nephew's history, you know? Yes. Would you know of or recommend any poets that are writing for what is going on in Iran? Um, I don't know the poets right now uh, of Iran. I've had stuff published there in, I can't read it, it's in Persian. <laughs> One thing I did learn was that Dari, which is the Afghan language, is very close to Persian. And I just had someone write to me today who also has a relative from Iran. And now he wants to collect Afghan and, and Iranian refugees and have them into poetry workshops that are taught in Dari and Persian. This just happened this morning, so it's funny you should bring this up. I'm sure that there are... Um, I'll find out for you. There are writers and resources now that are trying to document in real time what is going on on the ground in Iran. And you all know about this, right? The woman who was uh, murdered um, for not appearing in the right way, the right clothes, the right... So it's really what the Iranians rose up and enough, enough of enough of this harassment of people, basically, enough of the repression. Yeah, so it's a very inspiring thing, and it's, a, you know, the, the press in this country, and I think in probably in a lot of countries, they only pay attention to one thing at a time. And right now it's this election today. For a while it was Ukraine. For a heartbeat it was Iran. You know, but it's very hard to get news of the rest of the world. You have to leave the United States, and then you start getting news of the rest of the world. There's really kind of a... Uh, the corporate ownership of media kind of decided Americans weren't very interested in the rest of the world, or they didn't want them to be interested, or something else. But really, there isn't much international news here. You have to go online, which is can be done, and go to publications in Europe or elsewhere and find in any language you can read. And I recommend The Guardian. It's better than what we have here. But, you know, you can keep up. But poets, that's an interesting question, and I want to find that out about Iranian poets. There's one Iranian poet living in the United States. Her name is Sholei Wolpe, S-H-O-L-E-H. -E She's in L.A., her last name is W-O-L-P-E. You can Google her. She lives in L.A. I will ask her and pass that on to Anna, who can pass it on to you, or you can give me your email, and I will try to put you in touch, okay? And Shola has been here, so there's a couple of videos of her on our YouTube channel as well. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, yes? Um, well, two things now. If you want to read about, like, Diaspora and the Persian diaspora. The author of the Kite Runner has a lot of stuff out. Yes. I have Persian, so I'm not mm -hmm. reading Persian. Um, also, like Shirin Nishat, who's an artist who's been talking about what's going on in Iran. Sh
If you just go like on Instagram, you'll see. There's a book called The Shah of Shahs, also, which was by Richard Kapuczynski. It's a very interesting portrait of the Shah that goes way back in this history of how things got to be the way they are. Now, it will come as no surprise to you that the United States back to the Shah of Iran, and the Shah of Iran was subsequently overthrown. And that led us into this present period. So I'm very happy that you have these interests and connections and that you want to know these things, but thank you. The Kite Runner, and there's the author of The Kite Runner, as you said, um, has written a lot on the present situation, right? Okay, I want us to repeat it so everybody can hear it. Uh huh. Um, so, being like half Iranian and also half black, how would you like? What would you say to like poets and writers who struggle to write about what's going on, like within like their communities as they get abused and like they see it? Like, like, do you have anything to like suggest when? Like, First of all, you have the authority of your experience. You can write from that authority what you experience, what you go through, what you see. You don't have to have validation from the outside. You need to find your own way of talking on paper, as we could say, your own way of writing toward another person to help them to understand what it is you want them to know. I always think the most effective way is to tell stories because people can enter experience through story. And, you know, you're, you're, you're part of several different worlds. There's no reason why you can't fully inhabit all of them. You don't have to choose. You have experiences from different parts of your life, like we were talking about earlier, you know, with the boss and the parents and all of that. You also have that with your ethnicity and your race and everything else. Everything that comes that comes together in the complex, um, the beautiful complexity of you. So you don't have to choose one thing or another. You don't have to label yourself one thing or another. And you can speak your truth out of all the different parts of your life. You know, one day you can talk about an Iranian grandmother and the next day you can talk about a black brother, you know. It's, um, it's all real, it's all yours, and you have the authority of it. Yes? Um, you mentioned that the news anchors you were watching were almost never correct <laughs> in telling the right story. Um, I'm wondering what you have to say about dis discerning truth and misinformation. It's a very important skill to develop, is what I will say about it. Um, um, someone said to me once, my husband worked for Time Magazine for 20 years, and I went in different parts of the world with him. And we know from inside the media what, how, it, how the media operates. And I have great sympathy for a lot of journalists in the field. They don't always have the full decision about what comes out of their work. Um, someone said to me once, the newspaper seems to have it pretty right most of the time, unless you happen to know a whole lot about a particular thing, and then they've got it all completely wrong about that thing, right? So if you can think about it, this is, um, newspaper articles and media is, the, is there to distill and boil down and simplify and oversimplify very complex situations. They don't have much time. They have less time all the time. Little sound bites competing for attention. Underneath all of that is competing for money, competing for your eyes so that advertisers will buy ads and sell to you. It's all about that in our society. In our society, the media is a business. So just like you're skeptical about the used car, you know, where you're skeptical that this facial cream that costs $80 might not really work, you have to be skeptical about the media too. We were gonna write once a pamphlet, how it was gonna be titled, How to Read the New York Times, you know? And it had little things like, if it's on page A18, they don't really want you to notice it. 
If it doesn't have any byline, there's no author, be skeptical. It probably is a pre based on a press release from a government agency or something like that. I mean, there's, and, and unnamed sources, people don't want to be quoted. That's always interesting in one direction or another. You know, if, if people, right now, politicians don't want to be quoted. They'll tell reporters, oh, this or that about what's going on, but don't quote me, you know. What happened to courage? You know, what happened to standing on principle? This is something that I think we need. I don't have that pamphlet. I never wrote it. But I will say, when you're absorbing mass media, and most of the media in the United States is, it's all owned by four companies, just be skeptical. Inquire, question, think about it, get, get other sources. Uh, I don't want to use this phrase that the right wing uses all the time. They say, do your own research because they don't really mean research. They mean listen to psychobabble and conspiracy theories and whatever clear radio is telling you to think in your subconscious mind. Right now, we really have a problem. You know that we do. And it's no, no longer even the problem of simplification and media bias or anything like that. The, the real problem is more pervasive than that. Um, Noam Chomsky has some pretty good books on the subject. One is called Manufacturing Consent, and that's about the press, as I remember, and the media. There's a lot of books on media and, you know, how it operates and what happens in it. And your librarians are excellent yes. experts in the area. <laughs> Talk to the librarian. Research librarians love to be asked questions, and they have all kinds of resources. They would love to show you. It's really true, because I used to I used to be an untrained librarian, and I was nothing more exciting than have somebody come to my desk and ask me a question. Because they're all like detectives, you know? And they and they know where to find answers to things. What else? I think we have time for one or maybe two more, depending on how long Karen. I'm gonna give a, a poetry reading tonight. One more money more poems. This one I just wanted to really talk to you because I think it's important. Uh, in the back. Would you say the prison experience was the most intense moment of the assembly work? No. No, there was, no, it wasn't the most intense moment of, of my time there, or in the or of this book. It's one. Of, it's it's a very important moment because it taught me something that I I didn't read into what it taught me, but the lesson is there on a couple pages later. It taught me something, but it wasn't the most difficult moment, and it wasn't for me the scariest moment. There's other moments in the book that are about that. Yes. I think that one thing that I like to say is that witness is not an identity. I'm not a poet of witness. Witness is something we do all the time. And we become responsible not only for what we ourselves see, but for what we learn from others and what others tell us. And one of the things that, that we have to think about, I think especially in the U.S., uh, is, is to think about the collective, to think about we rather than I. There's a lot of pressure here to individuate, you know, to define ourselves as individuals, to label ourselves, to pigeonhole ourselves, and to care only for ourselves, or to feel that what we're supposed to be doing is competing with everyone else. Collective memory is the memory that humans have been creating since time immemorial. We make a contribution to it. That contribution is like a little mosaic chip, our mosaic chip. Everybody else puts their mosaic chips, and eventually it makes a picture. Collective memory is very important to honor and to be sensitive to and to understand exists. And it exists in defiance of, of false narratives and attempts to revise and attempts to cover up. 
You know, I you can actually, when I was growing up in the United States, no one ever mentioned really Native Americans. No one ever mentioned LGBTQ. They didn't exist then. You know, nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about slavery, really. You might refer to the Civil War, but they didn't really go into a lot of detail about what that was about. So we grow up in this Disneyland, you know, and we and we're not we're not we're just now, I think, in my lifetime, your generation and one ahead of it, maybe another one ahead of it, is coming to terms finally with the United States, what it has meant, but what it could mean in the future. You know, it's, uh, it's imp- you can't go forward until you know where you are and where you've been in a clear way. So a lot of the work that people are doing now is to try to establish that clarity. This is what this is what Manuel Argueta, the Salvadoran novelist, said. I quote him at the beginning of the book. He says, hope also nourishes us, not the hope of fools, the other kind. Hope, when everything is clear, awareness. You can have hope when you finally understand you know, and when you understand, it's because you've opened your eyes and because you've realized that maybe you didn't get the whole story. And so I just, I think we have to stop, but I'll sign some books if you like, and I'll be around tonight. I thank you very much. You've been very attentive. I hope it's been a useful hour for you. It's been really, really moving for me. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, there are some books for purchase. If there are any cookies left, grab the cookies on your way out. Oh, yes, and that's the book.